Good evening, everyone, and thanks for joining. My story begins in Stamford, Lincolnshire, about 20 years ago. As always, when I'm traveling, I went into the local secondhand bookshop, St. Mary's Books and Prints, and asked if they had anything about Spain. Nothing apart from a dictionary, a phrase book, and a couple of dog-eared paperbacks. But they said, leave us your details, and if anything crops up, we'll let you know. About seven years later, they contacted me to say that they had a copy of George Vivian's Spanish scenery, and would I be interested? I'd never heard of George Vivian or his scenery, but more out of admiration for their record keeping than anything else, I said yes. And this is the book that I want to talk about tonight. The catalyst for this talk has been Claudia Hopkinson's magnificent catalogue of the Romantic Spain exhibition that she curated last year in Madrid. I didn't see the show itself, but the book of the show is brilliant. If you only read one more book in your lifetime, read this. There are only four passing mentions of George Vivian in it, which is fine, it's not about him but it's prompted me to try and answer the key questions I want to examine tonight. Who the Dickens was George Vivian? What's so special about Spanish scenery? And how does he fit into the political context of the 1830s? Spanish scenery is a large folio published in London by Colnaghi and Co in 1838. It consists of this illustrated title page, a short preface under a half-page image of a bridge in Cordoba, a list of plates, and 27 further pages of hand-coloured lithographs, four of which have two images, making 33 views in all. It's a fairly rare book, and I soon found out why. The copy I bought was not in very good condition, and I thought I'd better get it conserved. Through a mutual friend, I contacted Jane McCosland, who's the UK's leading art on paper specialist. And as a favour, an expensive favour, she agreed to take it on. We left the title page as it was, and you can see from the amount of foxing, some of which has affected the vignette, which is the Alcazaba uh, in Malaga. The first thing Jane did was to take the book apart. Now, I'd always had a thing about not breaking up books for their plates, but she showed me that books like Vivian's were made to be broken up. The plates were pasted onto narrow strips of material called guards, bound into the spine like a normal pages would be. This means that the plates could be removed and reattached as required. In fact, we've left my copy unattached with each plate kept in an acid-free envelope and I've had two quick release frames made so that I can display the images in rotation. We've kept the original binding, of course, so the book can be put back together at a later date. This is entirely consistent with 19th century practice. There was a very good reason why collectors bought these books and broke them up. It was cheaper to do it that way. Individual lithographs were typically priced at one guinea plain, that's 21 shillings in old money, or 30 shillings coloured. As this advertisement confirms, Vivian's lithographs were marketed first in small batches of five or six before the whole set was put on sale at four guineas, that is four pounds and four shillings. The Bank of England's currency deflator reckons four guineas in 1838 are worth £9,180 now. But 30-odd views for 84 shillings works out at less than three shillings each, making a saving of over 70%. It's a wonder that any copies at all have survived at that rate. Most of them will have been pasted onto the walls of drawing rooms, as happened at Blickling Hall in Norfolk. So who was George Vivian Esquire? 
Well, he was clearly a gentleman, hence the style Esquire, which accompanied him everywhere. A gentleman, not a player, i.e. an amateur rather than a professional. Gentry, not trade. But never more than a gentleman. He's rarely mentioned in the national record, but when he is, he's described variously as an artist, a traveller, a connoisseur, and in the 1851 census, a landed proprietor. We don't have much more than the bare bones of his CV. He was born in the year of the French Revolution, educated at Eton and Oxford, though he seems not to have graduated, and admitted to the Inner Temple at the implausibly early age of 17. But there's no evidence that he ever practiced the law, or indeed ever did a stroke of work of any kind. By his early 20s, he was already making his way in the world, both geographically and socially. He travelled extensively in Northern Europe during 1818 and 1819 to Germany, Austria and the Balkans, and to the Near East in 1824, where he's reputed to have met Byron. In 1819, he became a founder member of the Travellers Club, the other founder members included the Marquis of Lansdowne, the Earl of Aberdeen, later Prime Minister, Earl Beecham, Viscount Palmerston, also a later PM, Lord Auckland and Sir Archibald MacDonald. So he was moving in exalted circles. More to the point, the club fine and the annual subscription were considerable, not to mention the requirement at all times to stand one's round. And when in 1829, the members appointed Charles Barry to build them this new clubhouse at 106 Pall Mall, George Vivian Esquire would have been expected to pay his share of the cost. How could he possibly afford it? Well, if we fill in a few more details, we can see where the money came from. George's father was John Vivian. He was called to the bar at the Inner Temple in 1785, which helps to explain George's earlier admission. And in the same year was appointed solicitor to the excise in Bristol. John's father was Matthew Vivian of Penelope in Cornwall. When he died in 1765, John Vivian inherited, and I quote, all the rest, residue and remainder of my household messages, goods, chattels, monies, mortgages and securities for money, tin and copper mines, and adventures. So the Vivian money came from mining. And in 1792, John consolidated his position by making a profitable marriage to Marianne Edwards, who had in inherited Cotton Lodge near Bristol in 1815. The following year, John bought Claverton Manor near Bath and built the new house that is now the American Museum. George Vivian inherited Claverton in 1828 and added the South Wing to make a gallery for his pictures. In 1841, he followed his father's example and made an equally good marriage to Elizabeth Ann Gray of Sackham Park in Hertfordshire. They had three children, Alice Jane, Ralph, and Minna Francis. Ralph died in 1924, a year after my father was born. As most of the people who feature in my research died centuries ago, I get a small thrill from knowing that only two lifetimes separate me from a man who was born in the 18th century. When he wasn't traveling abroad, George Vivian divided his time between Claverton and London. He lived at several addresses in the St. James area before finally settling at 11 Upper Grosvenor Street, where he died in January 1873. The 1851 and 1861 censuses tell us that he had 20 servants at Claverton and 12 at Grosvenor Street. For someone 
of George's interests, Pall Mall and the surrounding area was an obvious attraction, not just because that's where his club was situated, but because in the 1830s, it was a major centre for the visual arts. The Royal Academy and Christie's Auction House were there, along with the National Gallery, which you can see here in the top right-hand corner, along with the National Gallery at number 100. And a little further east lay the Society of Painters in Watercolours, of which Vivian was a member, close by Colnaghi's premises, where George Vivian's Spanish scenery would be printed in 1838. So for George, it was only a short walk from his club to his publishers. By now, you'll probably have formed a rather poor impression of George Vivian as an idle fellow living off the labours of Cornish tin miners and the fruits of his mother's inheritance. So let me try and address the balance. He appears to have been a serious, committed artist, collector and connoisseur and was treated as such by his contemporaries. When the old Houses of Parliament burned down in 1834, he was a appointed to the Royal Commission that selected the architect for the new Palace of Westminster, Charles Barry again. And when the Royal Fine Arts Commission was set up in 1841 to decide the interior decor of the new palace, George Vivian was appointed to that too. This was a serious step up for George. The commission was chaired by Prince Albert himself, and the 28 members included five past, present and future prime ministers, Peel, Melbourne, Russell, Gordon and Palmerston. George Vivian Esquire was one of only four members who didn't have a title. And that persistent use of the style Esquire worries me. Was he trying too hard? He was clearly valued for his expertise and his wealth, no doubt, opened a few doors. But did he suffer from the traditional British distaste for new money? Nevertheless, it's thanks to his role in the commission that we have a single ghostly image of him. In 1846, John Partridge painted a group portrait that's now in the National Portrait Gallery. The picture has deteriorated so badly that it's very difficult to interpret. But in 1872, Sir George Sharp produced this pen and ink key to the portrait. And there in the centre is George Vivian Esquire. So that's about it. If he kept a journal, we don't have it. If he wrote letters, we don't have them a man who rubbed shoulders with the great and the good for more than 40 years, appears to have risen without trace. But as we know so little about him, we can avoid what Terry Eagleton calls the English vice of attending more to an artist's work, uh, attending more to an artist's life than to his work. So let's talk about some pictures. <laughs> Here we're on firmer ground. We know that Vivian visited Spain at least twice in 1833 and 1837 because he tells us so in his preface. He also tells something about his motivation, conservation on the one hand, and what he calls adherence to truth on the other. From the drawings for this volume, the drawings for this volume were made at different periods in the years 1833 and 1837. During the first period, Spain was comparatively tranquil, and while the monastic bodies were still in existence throughout the country. During the second, I saw the demolition of some of the finest convents going on and observed the sites on which others had recently stood. The prospect of the speedy ruin of nearly all made me feel a strong desire to preserve some trace. In making the drawings, strict fidelity has been observed in delineating the face of the country, of the buildings and productions, and the dress and manners of its people. Upon an adherence to truth in these respects, the value of drawings of scenery must principally depend. <laughs> 
One, it's true that many of the worst of the effects of the Peninsular War and the restoration of Ferdinand VII had made Spain a comparatively tranquil country by the early 1830s. Travel in Spain was still not for the faint-hearted. The roads were terrible, the food was terrible, and nowhere was safe from thieves and footpads. At least, that was the general view. Although when Prosper Merrimay made his visit in 1830, he went in search of bandits, but found none, prompting the suspicion that travellers' tales were designed to make their authors appear more intrepid than they really were. But by 1833, things in Spain had definitely taken a turn for the worse. The death of Ferdinand VII that year ushered in the first of the so-called Carlist Wars between supporters of his daughter, the Infanta Isabella, and his brother, Don Carlos. But there was more at stake than just constitutional battles about sh who should have succeeded to the throne. There was also a complex overlay of intersecting cultural and religious fractures between liberals and conservatives, monarchists and abolitionists, Catholics and atheists, nationalists and internationalists. What clearly upset George Vivian were the consequences of the so-called Desamortización de Mendizábal of 1835, Spain's answer to the dissolution of the monasteries. The result was the widespread destruction of, of religious houses by disaffected parishioners who were keen to see the back of a corrupt clergy and get their hands on some free building materials. This undoubtedly explains why so many of Vivian's pictures show cathedrals, monasteries, convents and churches. It also, I think, helps to explain why, having made many of his drawings in 1833, he didn't publish them until 1838. My guess is that having made a second visit in 1837, he realised that his earlier drawings were a valuable record of a topographical and ecclesiastical landscape that was fast disappearing. Because the relationship between these two visits is so significant, it's worth trying to establish the chronology of the drawings, and there are a number of points of triangulation we can use. Spanish scenery itself and the following, uh, the, the, the following volume, the scenery of Portugal and Spain in 1839, advertisements for the, both of those books, and four of Vivian's sketchbooks, especially the one in the Biblioteca Nacional de España, and then John Frederick Lewis's Sketches of Spain and Parish Character of 1836, and David Roberts's Picturesque Sketches in Spain of 1837. Now, if we simply list the subjects of Spanish scenery, we get the following sequence. And you can see, you don't need to know much about the geography of Spain to see that this makes no sense at all as an itinerary. If you just look at the second line, for example, Burgos, Vitoria, Valencia on the east coast, Bilbao in the north, Segovia in the center, it, it doesn't make it doesn't make sense as an itinerary. And if we compare it to the 1839 volume, it seems much less well organized in several ways. In the 1839 volume, 30 of the 34 views are of Portugal with only four Spanish scenes thrown in for good measure. All the plates were drawn by the same artist, Louis Haig. None of them appears to have been issued separately and the volume seems to have been conceived and executed to a clear plan and energetically marketed through a succession of advertisements in several newspapers throughout December 1838 and January 1839. By contrast, Spanish scenery is much more of a ragbag. The plates were drawn by three artists, Louis Haig, Thomas Schotter Boys, and Paul Gulchi. Four of them are unsigned, and two were drawn on zinc rather than stone. As we've seen, the views were originally sold in instalments, and the resulting volume looks more like a samalband, assembled from a range of different materials. 
If life weren't so short, it would be worthwhile to collate all of the surviving copies to see if the contents are the same in each one. Nevertheless, by triangulating with the Vivian sketchbook in the Biblioteca Nacional, we can detect some organizational principles behind the 1838 volume. At first sight, the order of images in the sketchbook looks pretty random too, but it's clear that, like many artists, Vivian didn't start at page one or work through to the end. Again, this is no kind of itinerary, but two things do stand out. One is that all the places in this sketchbook are in the northern half of the country or in southern France. And the second is that if we plot these locations on a map, a plausible itinerary does emerge. By sea to Bayonne, Saint-Jean-de-Luz, Saint-Sebastien, Bilbao, Vitoria, Burgos, Palencia, Valencia, Segovia, Madrid, excursion to Escorial, then across to the east coast to Valencia, and then up the east coast to Morviedro, Tarragona, Barcelona, Montserrat, and then onwards to Paris and from Paris to London by Eurostar. It makes perfect sense. So that's a, a perfectly sensible round trip and takes in all of the places that feature in the ske sketchbook. It also happens to replicate Joseph Townsend's recommended itinerary in his journey through Spain of 1786. And not only that, the first stages of this journey look rather like a tour of Peninsula War battlefields. Wellington's victory at Vitoria in particular was the decisive battle of the war against the French. And the first image in the sketchbook is a view of the Pyrenees from the castle of Marac. Now the Chateau de Marac was Napoleon's favorite lodging during the Peninsular War. It was here that he received the abdication of Charles IV and Ferdinand VII in 1808 before installing his brother Joseph to, as King of Spain. The castle burned down in 1825, so Vivian had little to show other than the view from the castle around itself. But he did go there, so please hold that thought for later. None of the sketches in the Biblioteca Nacional album made their not, sorry, not all of the ske sketches in the Biblioteca Nacional album made their way into the 1838 volume, but 14 of them did. And as I promised you some pictures, here's a sample. This is a view of Segovia. And this is what Louis Haig made of it for the printed volume. I'll just show you those again. And this is the convent of San Juan de la Cruz in Segovia. And this is Louis Haig's version for the printed volume. And this is the famous Puente Real in Valencia. And that's how it appears in the printed volume. Well, I don't think it's churlish to say that these comparisons do Louis Haig more favours than they do George Vivian. You have to admire the adjustments that Haig made to the sketches to capture the breadth of, of Vivian's vision in a smaller format. And you have to admire the subtlety and deftness of his line compared with Vivian's harder edged, more architectural approach. Now, if we compare the reorganized sketchbook images with the contents of the 1838 volume, we can see that an outline structure emerges. There seem to me to be three groups here. The first group of views from the south of the country 
don't appear in the sketchbook. The second group from the northern half of the country are almost all in the sketchbook. And the third group, largely from the south of the country, are not. The groupings aren't exact. Maliga is out of place in the second group and Bilbao and Vigo are out of place in the third. But each of those is an exception for another reason. Malaga was drawn by Thomas Schotter Boys, as opposed to Louis Haig, and Bilbao was drawn by Paul Galci, while Vigo is unsigned. If you allow those exceptions, the question then arises, why is the book organized in this way, with the Northern views sandwiched between the two groups of Southern views? To answer this question, we need to go back to the advertisement we looked at earlier. The second paragraph in particular. The collection, consisting of 30 views, now forms a companion volume to Lewis and Roberts's sketches. And as it includes many interesting subjects which have not appeared in any other work, makes the series of Spanish views more complete. Now, Colnagis were obviously aware that they were selling into a crowded market, and one already occupied by two much more eminent artists than Vivian. By Lewis and Roberts's sketches is meant, I assume, John Frederick Lewis's Sketches of Spain and Spanish Character, based on drawings he made in 1833 and 1834, and published in London in 1836 and David Roberts's picturesque sketches in Spain, based on drawings made in 1832 and 1833, and published in London in 1837. Roberts's publishers, Hodgson and Graves, were located at number six, Pall Mall, four doors down from Colnagis, which must have sharpened the competitive edge. This is clearly, in my view, why Colnagis stressed the importance of complementarity Vivian's book should be seen as a companion volume that makes all three publications more complete. It's a clever ploy. It recognizes that Colnaghi were late to the party, their author was a less well-known amateur, and his approach to Spanish scenery was rather different from Lewis's and Roberts's. But it also helps to raise Vivian to their level, making him a colleague rather than a rival. The differences in approach between the three men are very marked. This is here are a couple of uh, images here from Lewis's sketches of Spain and Spanish character. And you can see that Lewis was much more interested in costumbrismo, characters and costume, views that anticipate the images published in Los Españoles Pintados por Sí Mismos of 1843, and even Ortiz de Chagüez, Tipos y Trajes, a century later. And Roberts is much more dramatic, as we would expect from a man who started out as a scene painter. He really knows how to imbue a scene with character. Spirituality, here in, in the case of the high altar at Seville Cathedral on the left. Humour on the right in the Correo de los Moriscos in Granada, and dignity in this iconic view of the Giralda Tower in Seville. Vivian, by contrast, as you will have seen, likes to look at his scenery from afar. He prefers the panoramic view, rarely gets close enough to a building to show us any detail, and never takes us inside unless it is to look out. In many ways, his views seem quite conservative, even backward looking, reminiscent perhaps of Swinburne, for example. This is Swinburne's representation of Madrid from the 1810 edition of his picturesque tour through Spain, with its huge sky, diminutive buildings, and decorative figures in the foreground. Vivian also tends not to tread on others' territory, which accounts for some obvious gaps in his coverage, even when we 
do have sketches of, for example, Madrid from the Buen Matiro or the Escorial or Burgos Cathedral, they're not included in the 1838 volume. But there are some exceptions, almost always among the Southern views, that may reflect his and Colnaghi's awareness of the market. In the opening and closing groups, we find a lot more people, much greater emphasis on costume and customs, but also a much closer viewpoint. And I'll finish with a couple of examples. This is the Plaza de San Francisco in Seville. And it's a rare instance where Vivian intrudes on Roberts's ground. The, as you can see, the picture positively teems with people. You can almost hear the publisher saying, for goodness sake, put some people in your pictures, Mr. Vivian, and get in closer. But look what he does with the Giralda Tower. It's pale and ghostly and completely lacks the dominant presence that it has for Roberts. It's more a symbol of fading grandeur than anything else. And here too, in the Plata del Campillo in Granada, we see Vivian experimenting with a more modern, more human approach. The scene is well populated, and this is the tightest viewpoint that Vivian ever achieves. But there's that same sense of decay, the ruined castle in the distance and the crumbling masonry on all the buildings rendered in unforgiving detail by Louis Haig. They speak of a declining post-imperial power, and they remind us that not the least devastating aspect of the Napoleonic invasion was the collapse of Spain's overseas empire. Between 1810 and 1825, 15 former colonies declared independence without Spain being able to lift a finger to stop it. The Spanish politics that George Vivian was so well attuned to had its transatlantic dimension too. So to a conclusion and a couple of footnotes. My conclusions, not necessarily definitive, but uh, this is, I think, a reasonable summary of where I think we've got to. George Vivian was a serious artist, but not a very good one, or perhaps not a particularly good one. He owed a great deal to his lithographer, Louis Haig. He made himself useful in London society, but he was not indispensable. His wealth may have shielded him from some degree of class prejudice, may not have shielded him from some degree of class prejudice. He traveled to Northern and Eastern Spain in 1833, as evidenced by the Biblioteca Nacional sketchbook. He traveled to Portugal and Southern Spain in 1837 and was struck by the impact of the first Carlist War. He decided to publish some of his drawings as a way of documenting both before and after. His southern drawings, I think, show some influence of the work of Lewis and Roberts and a more modern approach. But I th strongly think that his two volumes of lithographs do, as the publishers claimed, make the series of Spanish views more complete. And for that reason, I think they're worthy of serious consideration. A footnote to the Vivian family. Vivian was a very common name in Cornwall, and there are many John Vivians in the records that make it difficult always to be sure which is which. But I think it's very possible that John Vivian was first cousin once removed to this Vivian, Sir Richard Hussey Vivian, later Lord Vivian, who distinguished himself by fighting in the Peninsular War and later at Waterloo. I wonder whether the possible family connection influenced George's interest in Spain, especially in the Northwest Quadrant that I believe he visited first in 1833. He didn't need a relative to visit Spain and he didn't need a war hero to visit the sites of some of the most famous battles, but it's a thought. And one final comment on rarity and price. 
There are only four copies of Spanish scenery in this country on WorldCat, not including mine and Vivian's own copy in the Library of the Travellers Club, and there are only two in Spain. For most of this year, there's only been one copy for sale with a London dealer. But word of this talk has obviously got around because in the past few weeks, five more have suddenly come on the market. One in London and four in Spain at asking prices between four and a half and five and a half thousand pounds. So you're in luck. And if you're prepared to haggle, you might get a bargain. If you do decide to enter the market, let me know and we'll start a Vivian Owners Club. Thank you.